Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to today's webinar presentation. This is the fourth webinar of a six-part series that will run every Thursday until May 7th as part of our Forest Invasive Spring Series. To learn about the rest of the series, please visit www.forestinvasives.ca. My name is David Nisbet, and I'm the coordinator for the Forest Invasives Project at the Invasive Species Centre in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. The Invasive Species Centre is a non-profit organization created in 2011. We connect stakeholders' knowledge and technology to prevent and control the spread of invasive species that harm Canada's environment, economy, and society. We build networks of experts and stakeholders to identify and act on priority invasive species. We provide funding, coordinate, and lead projects in natural and applied science, technology transfer, outreach, and education and we consolidate and disseminate information to raise awareness leading to the prevention of harmful invasive species. If you want to learn more about the ISC, you can visit our website at www.invasivespeciescenter.ca. Our speaker today will be Dr. Mark Whitmore. Mark is a forest entomologist in the Department of Natural Resources at Cornell University and has been studying insects that feed on trees for over 30 years, the last 10 of which he has focused on invasive non-native insects. Mark currently works with land managers, state and federal agencies, local governments, and concerned citizens to help them understand the issues and strategies for minimizing the impacts of forest pests. Mark's research is on biological control of hemlock woolly adelgid and on emerald ash borer ecology. If you have a question for Mark during the presentation, please enter it into the side panel of the GoToWebinar program and we will do our best to answer as many questions as possible with the remaining time at the end of the program. At this time, I would like to turn the presentation over to Dr. Mark Whitmore and he will take it from here. Okay, <clears throat> can you hear me there? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Oh. Okay, great. Um, so thank you very much. First of all, it's a, it's a real honor to be uh, speaking to my friends in Canada. Um, it's, I got to say that it's one of my favorite places to go is to go canoeing up in Ontario, and I'm really happy to uh, be able to give something back uh, to Canada. So yeah, and I hate to be the how do you say the bearer of some pretty grim news, but it's the hemlock really indulgent. You know, I think it is a formidable pest, and uh, and it's it's amazing what it's done uh, in the southern states, uh, south of New York here. Um, but I do think that there are uh, uh, options that we have that we can put in play and manage them. So the the the, the uh, focus of my talk is going to be sort of on the evolution of my thought and uh, where where we've been in New York and and where I think we need to go in order to uh, effectively uh, save our hemlock forests. I mean, it's, it's, that's it. I mean, our hemlock forests basically um, are in, in, in very dire danger of disappearing. Uh, and I think it's the responsible thing to do is start acting well before uh, we actually see trees dying. So um, there it is. There's the hemlock woolly adelgid. Uh, this is a very early stage infestation when it first gets on the uh, twigs. You can see the white woolly masses forming there. Um, so the uh, woolly adelgid is an is a aphid-like thing in the family Adelgidae. There are a, a number of species around the world. Um, the hemlock woolly adelgid actually uh, is found in five distinct uh, genetic populations. Uh, the work of Nathan Havel is was quite interesting where he defined five populations that are native, two in China, two in Japan, and one in the Pacific Northwest. I think for a long time we considered the uh, population in the Pacific Northwest to actually be uh, uh, an, an imported population, an invasive population, but the genetics is, is quite unequivocal that they are uh, genetically distinct from the other populations. The population that we have on the east coast, on Suga canadensis and Caroliniana, actually comes from the southern part of Japan, where it's on Suga Um 
the host trees in North America for hemlock woolly diligent, of course, eastern hemlock and Carolina hemlock on the east coast, but also western hemlock uh, on the west coast in the Pacific Northwest where I grew up and learned forest entomology. Uh, uh, it was a, it was a, it was a, uh, we didn't even think about hemlock woolly diligent. It's there. Uh, it, ex it exists on the branches of trees. You see it every once in a while. And um, you know, when I moved back east here, uh, back in the 80s, and all of a sudden I, I, I got an idea that we really might have a problem. And, and one of the things that gives me hope, though, is that I actually went back west uh, to visit mom and dad at one point in time, and it dawned on me that maybe I should go to the Arboretum in, uh, in Seattle and uh, see if there's any eastern hemlock trees there. And sure enough, uh, they, they're really nice. They planted out hemlock, eastern hemlock trees planted in 1945 right next to western hemlock trees planted at the same time. And they both had a diligent and they both looked just fine. So my question has always been, well, what the heck's going on? And, um, you know, I, I'm, you know, it could be resistance uh, of the trees, something about the, uh, the environment of the west coast operating on the genes of the hemlocks, but I, I really am, uh, uh, the, the population fluctuations that I see on the hemlocks out there leads me to believe that it's more of a predator-prey relationship uh, than, than it is uh, uh, resistance, although resistance definitely could be a part of that. Um, this is just to confuse the heck out of you. Um, this is a really complex life cycle. This is a very complex insect, actually. You know, it's just this little tiny bag of protoplasm, maybe a millimeter, a little bit more than a millimeter in diameter, but it has seven distinct uh, adult life stages. Um, the primary host is on a spruce, and the secondary host is hemlock. We call the primary host spruce because that's where there's sex. On hemlock, there's no sex. And interestingly enough, uh, here we, you know, we have a, a native, we consider H, uh, hemlock willy adelgid to be native on the west coast, but there are no primary spruce hosts out there. There's no sex on the west coast, and there's no sex on the east coast. So we only have the hemlock uh, as a host in North America. Um, I'm going to make the simple life cycle here. Um, there are two generations a year on hemlock trees in North America. We have, and we call one of them the cystins, and then the progridians. The cystins generation is basically what we have right now. And the cystins generation begins growing in October. Um, you can see the, the hand there, is that right? So it starts growing there in, in, in October and plumping up, and then it uh, continues to grow when the temperatures are favorable. Uh, you know, nothing grows when it's you know, 20 below, but you know, in the tree it actually gets pretty warm when you get some sun on it and stuff. And so they grow throughout the winter time and they start to plump up. And I fully expected to see uh, eggs on the adults of the cistern generation uh, very uh, uh, not too long ago, but they really um, have uh, uh, been late this year. And um, so we're looking at probably getting the eggs of the cistern's oh, we're you know, I would say the end of April, or well, already, already the end of April, so into May. So we're three weeks behind already. But anyway, so that the eggs of the cystins hatch into the progridians, and the progridians develop uh, through May into June, and I found them into July last year. Uh, they lay their eggs, and so the cystins generation then hatches out, and the uh, only dispersal stage of the uh, hemlock woolly diligent is after the eggs hatch. And here on the right-hand side, we have a crawler there. You can see how tiny that is. If the adult is a, just over a millimeter in size, the crawler is just like you know, a tenth of a millimeter, maybe at the most a quarter of a millimeter. But basically, that's the only dispersal stage right there. So when the crawler then uh, settles down and puts its mouth parts into the twig tissue near the base of the needle, that's where it stays for the rest of its life. And you can actually pull it out at any time uh, after it's inserted its stylets, and the insect will die. It will not be able to reinsert its stylets into the tissue. So when the system generation crawler settles down, it turns into this little tiny black dot, and that's how it spends most of the summer. And you can see that that's probably a pretty good strategy if you're trying to avoid predation. In the middle of summer when all the predators are out, you're just this teeny tiny unappetizing little dot on a twig. So, let me see. Oops, wrong way. There we go. 
So this is the crawler. Um, and the crawler, as, as, as a dispersal stage, it's uh, very interesting. I think that when you get to within a stam, the crawler is so small that it you know, probably just wind disperses it throughout the stand. But long distance dispersal, I think uh, uh, researchers are probably in pretty good agreement that long distance dispersal is facilitated by birds. Where this little thing, here you see those are, those are the legs on it. And actually it's really fast. You look at it under a dissecting scope and it's almost like a racehorse. You imagine a, a, a bird coming down and putting its feet on a twig and the adult you can jump onto the bird's feet and then the bird will carry it to the next twig where it will come off. Whereas the chances of it being blown in the wind long distances and landing on another twig of a hemlock are, are really, really low. Um, let's see, I've already discussed this. I think I'm just going to move quickly on here. So, of course, I'm going the wrong way. There we go. And there is the photogenic adult insect itself. You can see the mouth parts down there. They actually are probably three times long, as long as what you see right there. But they'll actually, when you pull them out of the twig, they'll be whipping them around uh, like, a, like a whip. It's, it's a really quite a remarkable structure. And you can see also you've got these glands right here on the dorsal surface of the body. And that's where the white wax is, is, uh, is uh, produced. And um, so here we have the adults with the eggs. And the cistins generation is generally more fecund than the progredients generation. Um, and this, the hash of the, of the eggs from the cistins adults is more punctuated because it goes over the winter. And then when the sun temperatures finally get warm enough, they're all at the right stage. And boom, so it's just got this huge flush of eggs coming out shortly. But the progridians, they hatch over a longer period of time and you get overlapping, gener overlapping uh, life stages. So um, that's, you know, it's, it's sort of a simple life cycle and you can, don't consider the sex and the different stages, uh, adult stages. But, you know, how does it impact the tree? And I think uh, the important thing to realize is that it probably isn't the fact that it sucks juice out of the tree. It feeds on the uh, xylem ray parenchyma cells in, in, the, in, the, in the twig itself, not on the needle. But it tends to like to settle right there at the base of the needle. But you can see that picture up there on the right-hand side. You've got all those little white dots up there. It's like a... Like a, a like a voodoo doll almost. Imagine you're putting in a bunch of pins in the voodoo doll. Well, the tree has a generic response to any kind of injury, um, like be it pathogen or, or you know, a hatchet or whatever. And so in this case, it's the stylus of the aphid, the adelja going in there. And so it likes to wall off those things so, that, so the injury doesn't uh, progress, so the fungi don't grow. Uh, um, and, and in that walling off process, it actually sort of, it clogs up the uh, uh, conductive tissue and actually impedes the capacity to deliver um, uh, mineral and water to the enlarging buds and into the foliage. And that's what, that's what generally kills it. It's sort of like killing itself. Um, now, exactly how long it takes to kill a tree is something that is uh, uh, some up for debate all the time. Uh, I think one of the things we like to do at media is to sit around and talk about all these different stands that we go into uh, and how long it's taken for the trees to die. Um, I think down in the south, it's very rapid. In Georgia and, and uh, the Great Smoky Mountains, four years is what they're talking about. And I, that's, that's something I haven't seen in the Finger Lakes area uh, in, up here in New York. Um, or I've seen, actually, it's probably about six, six to eight years so far I'm looking at for mortality. But I think that in other areas, like in the upper reaches of the Catskill Mountains, or for some reason, some stands in some places, it takes 10 years or more. And indeed, I was in Massachusetts not too long ago with a colleague, and we were skiing through the woods, and he says, well, guess how, old, guess how long the Hemacolia delta's been here? And I, the trees look like heck, but he said, yeah, he said, it's been 20 years. Um, so I don't know how much longer they're going to hold on. Uh, they, were, they were looking pretty bad. But, you know, it's sort of like, it, it's it there. It's a variable. There's all sorts of variables associated with this insect, and, and we're, we're always trying to figure things out. Um, and, indeed, the old and the weak trees are, are the first to succumb. It's, you know, it's sort of logical. It happens a lot of biology. So what is the problem? The problem is, basically, there's asexual reproduction. There's no males. Uh, so it's basically there's no founder effect. One individual can start a new population. That's an important thing to think about. And, you know, it's like, one individual, that's all you need is one of those crawlers to settle and you can start pumping out eggs uh, that generation. If you think about it, reproductive potential, uh, 
some researchers, researchers have found up to 200 eggs per female, but uh, I have never seen that. And, and uh, I think 150 uh, for each generation is conservative, maybe even a little bit of a high number, but still it's astounding to think that, that, that one, the progeny from that one successful settler can be up to 5,000 uh, in one year. And that's just one year. Um, another big problem is we have no uh, native natural enemies in the eastern United States. And that's the, the heart of our biological control program, classical biological control. Um, and indeed, there's no documented resistance uh, by eastern or Carolina hemlock either. So um, that's the problem. No resistance, no natural enemies, huge reproductive potential. Um, so I think one of the most important things uh, in thinking about the hemlock willow adelgid and in its management is detection. Uh, early detection is absolutely critical, and it is really, really hard. Now this is a uh, this is like really late detection. Uh, you can see there the the green color of the hemlock has disappeared because it's all got that white stuff all around on, on the uh, uh, needles. And you can actually see this at a, at a great distance. Um, when you're thinking about like going through a stand of trees, uh, there are a number of things to do. Um, of course, not everybody has pole pruners or tree climbing uh, capacity. Uh, just inspecting the branches near the ground. And you look at the underside of the branches, and sometimes you can stare up. You can get the light just right, so you can look at the twig and be sure you're not getting reflections. And so you can actually look pretty far up into the crown if you got it right. Um, binoculars I don't really like to use because I get a lot of false positives because of the glare on, on the needles. It's, it's not an easy thing. Um, but one of the most, most interesting is actually uh, going out into a stand in the wintertime after there's been a storm and you get all these twigs that have been snapped off and fallen to the ground or if you're around porcupines that have been cutting off the twigs from a tree, uh, they'll be all over the ground. You can look at those, those twigs. That's a, a, really, a really good way to look at them. Um, and it's really important also that if you ever you're entering a stand to go near water. Again, it's the bird thing. What does a bird do usually when it comes into a stand? You know, goes in, lands maybe, maybe near water, and uh, lands on the branches of a tree near the water, and then goes down to the water, and then comes back up to the uh, tree, and then takes off again. And I say this because I think there's only two times I have found maybe the first trees ever uh, in a stand to be infested. And both of those times, the trees are right next to water, and it was the branches immediately adjacent to the water that had small infestations on them. And nowhere else on those tree or anywhere else in the stand uh, did I find hemlock willow adelgids. Um, another good way is to look for the telltale sign of the wool in the stand. If you got, especially if you have a, 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 a if there's been a rain and, and the stems of the hemlock trees are nice and wet, nice and dark, you can see that white woolly stuff. It will be stuck to the bark. And here on the left, we have uh, uh, Jeff Fidgens is working with me down here trying to devise a, a technique uh, to, to look for very low-level populations, shooting balls up in the trees with Velcro. And it's actually a really interesting project um, because we've been into a stand recently where I could find none of these woolly wisps on the bark and no other indication that they were there. And they went in with pole pruners, pole pruners and found a couple uh, of adelgids on the branches higher up. So I'm really hopeful for this uh, detection technique. And I just can't uh, emphasize enough how important it is to get early detection uh, into a stand. And when you do find it in a stand, be sure that you're looking and delimitating it accurately. Because looking at the lower branches, it just doesn't work if you're really trying to delimit the stand. So this is what it looks like in the summertime. Um, Detection in the summer is really difficult. You, you got to have to have you have to have a hand lens really to, to see the estimating systems generation. Um, but it also doesn't limit your capacity to detect uh, this insect in the stand. If you just wait for winter, you're missing a lot of opportunity for detection. Um, when you have early infestation. This is what it looks like. Because what happens? Remember, is when the adelgid puts its stylus into the tree, into the twig, it degrades that food source. It actually you know, walls it off. And so um, the degradation of that tissue demands that after it's already infested these, then it goes to 
the next new shoots out. So if you look a little further on in the infestation, you can see these older twigs that have been infested, they harbor very few adelgid as compared to the first ones there. And indeed, you can see maybe in the back here, there's a new shoot that has a little bit more on it. Um, so you can sort of like age an infestation just by looking at uh, the, the way the twigs look and the amount of adelgids that are on it. And this is a very late stage infestation, very few successful adelgids on that tissue. Um, so here we have the smiley face. That's actually a North Star on different computers. It works differently. I'm not trying to fool around here. Um, but I like this map because it uh, almost, I guess the American distribution didn't come out. Um, but basically, the distribution of hemlock comes all the way down here into uh, Georgia, and there's a disjunct population here. But basically, hemlock woolly adelgid is really covering a large part of the population right now. And this is, and it's in this area as well. I like this because it has the Canadian population up there. Um, oh, wrong way, sorry. So this is the distribution of hemlock in New York State. Uh, and just looking at the uh, figures recently, I realized that New York has perhaps more hemlock than any other state uh, in the United States, or at least on the East Coast. And a lot of those hemlocks are based up here in the Adirondacks. Um, but it's a very important component of the forests and the Catskills, the southern tiers, and perhaps also here where you don't see as many because they form islands, the habitat islands of this foundation species. And this is the uh, progression of the population outbreak in, in New York State. I think this is. It should be starting in 1987. Uh, the animation is not working on this. So then we'll just go here to 2014. So it started down the Hudson Valley in 87 and gradually went up the Hudson Valley. We got it in the Finger Lakes here in 2008, and it's been going like crazy in the Finger Lakes. The interesting thing is here we see it popping up way out here in the western part of the state. This spot near Buffalo and this up near Rochester was definitely associated with uh, uh, nursery stock being moved in. Um, as has the, the population, I think, in the Toronto area that I looked at with Jeff uh, and Taylor. So um, I'm going back there. Um, the ecological impact is um, it's huge, and uh, I, I probably don't even need to mention it, but um, when you consider uh, um, hemlock, it's a foundation species. You know, I think I've you know, been dealing with the emerald ash borer. Emerald ash borer disappears. It's like we're still going to have functionally uh, in, intact hardwood forests. But when we lose the hemlock, uh, there it's just a it's a critical species in the habitat that they create. And I think one of the one of the things about it is that it's it's just so common that we take them for granted. And and indeed we depend on the ecosystems uh, that they build and maintain uh, for a wide number of services. And you know you think about them, the water resources they Provide, they moderate water temperatures for trout to breed in, uh, provide a buffer for nutrient inputs to maintain water quality, soils, they stabilize shallow soils, especially in the steep gorges around here in the Finger Lakes. Soil chemistry is made more uh, acidic, provide shelter for animals and plants, and, uh, and when they die, you open up the stand to invasive plant species. And, um, so it's pretty much a, a big change that happens, and this is just an illustration of the potential impacts near near here in Ithaca, or Skinny Atlas Lake, as a double-A unfiltered water source for the city of Syracuse. And hemlock is a major component of that gorge that you see running up there on Bear Swamp Creek. And if it disappears, you have all those inputs from agriculture and, and who knows what else getting into this water, and then Syracuse is faced with having to build a water filtration plant besides the fact that it's just a gorgeous lake, and it'd be sad to see it, its water quality diminish. So natural control of insect populations, we have host tree resistance, abiotic factors, temperature, humidity, biological control, and really it's an additive effect of all these things. So when we think about controlling hemlock woolly adelgid, we have to take all of these things uh, into, con into consideration. Host tree resistance, you know, right now we think we might have uh, resistance showing up in a stand in New Jersey and maybe elsewhere, we're just not really sure, because it's, uh, it's hard to get at. Uh, is the same tree resistant in one place as it is as another, if you plant it into another location? There's just so many things that go on. The age of the tree, is that, that affects its resistance. So 
we're looking at it, uh, uh, but right now this thing is moving, the hemlock woolly dove is moving so fast, uh, we really have to look at other things. Abiotic factors, temperature, uh, that's, that's an incredibly uh, uh, important question. I think that a lot of people have looked at its potential susceptibility to cold temperatures and said, oh, well, then we don't need to worry about it further to the north. And anybody who's familiar with the balsam woolly adelgid, that's really not true. A very close relative of the hemlock woolly adelgid, we used to think it would be limited to the coastal areas. Well, now I find it up at the higher elevations in some of the coldest places uh, uh, in the East Coast, like Mount Washington. Um, so the hemlock woolly adelgid uh, has been found to have 3% uh, survive at minus 22 Fahrenheit to minus 30 degrees Celsius. That doesn't happen very often. Minus 35, they found none survived. Um, I, you know, it's like there's a lot of variability going on, a lot of a lot of things, and um, I'm not really all that certain about that. Uh, the one thing that is the scariest part is that uh, Bruton showed that tolerance of low temperatures is a genetically linked trait. So you get survivors, you're going to have a whole population. Uh, that is uh, resistant. So I've been doing some re research recently in the New York area, and uh, you can see these are the low temperatures here, minus 30 degrees, uh, uh, see that's Fahrenheit, right, okay, so we're talking minus 22, you know, it's, it's in these areas right here, and, and, you know, there's not very much area that this is the extreme lowest temperature, um, and, and, and um, there's not a lot of area that would be quote-unquote immune according to the data as collected right now. But, uh, you know, what is it about the temperature? Is it the extreme low temperature that you see just once, or is it the longer period of time? And my experience in the last winter was that, in the last two winters, which have been really bad for us here, um, the winter before this last one, the temperatures went lower than they did this winter. The extremes were lower, but this winter, the temperatures stayed low longer, and we got much more mortality this winter than we did the winter before. So it's how you look at it, really. Um, and so I did a study based on the, uh, looking at two study sites, this warmer site right here next to Ithaca and the one up here in Minekill State Park in the northern Catskills where it got really cold. Um, and so last winter I looked at that, and I haven't got the data finalized for this winter, but this basically the trend is follows for both uh, winters, that where the lowest temperature was only minus 8 Fahrenheit or minus 22 uh, at Tuganic State Park, it was minus 31 at Minekill State Park. Uh, at the warmer place, I got 91% mortality, and the colder place, I got 82% mortality. So that says to me that maybe we might have populations adapting to the cold already in a very short period of time. Um, really, it'll take super cooling tests to really uh, nail that down, and I hope to do that uh, this next winter. I started to do it this winter, but there was just so much mortality, I didn't have enough uh, sample, a great enough sample size to work with. Um, so there's the grim reality. Uh, this is down in the, uh, uh, in the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. Uh, it's huge, and you know that old song that I love so much, you don't know what you got till it's gone, is really uh, coming out to play. And I'm trying to get out ahead of the curve here in New York. Uh, the biological control program has been put in place. We figure, you know, they found it in the 50s, so really the biological control program started pretty late in the game, back in 1993. Interestingly enough, there's no parasitoid, no parasitic wasps or pathogens. And so we've been working on predators, uh, coccinellids and derodonta beetles from Eastern Asia and the Pacific Northwest. Six species have been released to date, two in New York State. Um, and uh, this is one that we first worked with throughout the East Coast, Society of Mitsugi. And it's very easy to rear, and so hundreds of thousands uh, were reared and released all over the East Coast, and I'm not going to really dwell on this very much other than to say we have very few recoveries. It seemed to have good synchrony with, with the adelgid, and indeed it's an insect that feeds on that stage that's very teeny tiny in the summertime. Um, but really the, the recaptures, considering the amount, of, the amount that were released uh, over the East Coast uh, over time, uh, the fact that we can find very few is something that's very troubling, and so we're really not focusing on this insect any longer. Um, 
one of the interesting ones uh, coming up now is Skimnus camptodromus. It's a coccinella beetle or ladybird beetle from China. It comes from the cooler regions in the mountains of China. Uh, we've just finished the host specificity trials and the people that are working on this feel that it really uh, has a lot of potential. It has really great synchrony with the hemochloidelgid life cycle. Um, the only problem is it's really difficult to rear in the lab and I hope we get this uh, through all of the screening uh, that it is. It's almost finished right now, but the population that we have uh, at the Forest Service Lab in Connecticut is down to below 500 individuals. So I hope we don't lose this one before we can actually get to work with it. Um, another one is Skinnerus coniferarum. Um, another ladybird beetle from, uh, this is from the Pacific Northwest. Again, close synchrony with the Delgid life cycle. Um, and you know, I think that uh, the one of my colleagues who works, who's been collecting in the Pacific Northwest, looks at this and says, well, this is one that's more common in drier areas. And so when you think about the biological control, you want to have not just one, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. You want to have things that, that operate in different areas so we can sort of like fill all those little niches uh, that are available. Um, and this one also likes to, to feed on those, uh, the indulgent in the summertime. Another one, one of the, the most, one of the more common uh, predators in the Pacific Northwest is Leucopus argenticollis, and I should also put in there Argentus. Uh, <laughs> uh, I've forgotten the name right now. Pinnaperda, right? Oh, sorry. Anyway, so another Leucopus. Both of them are there. They're actually St. Patrick. It's hard to tell them apart unless you uh, pin them and kill them. So um, we're working with both species. And I've just received uh, um, my federal uh, application has been approved to, to uh, release them in New York State. And hopefully we'll get them going. We're just starting to work with this insect. One of the problems is that you really have to rear out the larva that you can see in the upper right and the right hand side there. You have to rear it to an adult to be sure that it is parasitoid free. And then you have to, the adults don't live very long. And so working with the adults is always a rush job. You got to you rear them out and you got to get them and get them out into the wild. And it's, um, it's, a, it's a touchy thing, but it would be very good to get this insect out there. Interestingly enough, this insect, the same species has been identified all throughout uh, North America on the East Coast as well as the West Coast. But it doesn't feed on the Hemlochloidelgid on the East Coast. Now, is that a, a, a you know, local adaptation of the population? It just doesn't know to, that there is a food source on hemlock. It doesn't know to search hemlock. They feed on pine trees. They feed on pine bark adelgid. Um, but not on, on the hemlock delgid. I think that this is, points out the inadequacy of uh, perhaps our taxonomy and that we really need to get great taxonomy uh, uh, to, in order to use biological control most effectively. Uh, Laracobius osakensis. Laracobius is a genus of a small family of the Derodontidae, and Laracobius is found uh, whole arctically and it only feeds on delgids. Um, the other two genera in the family feed on fungi, but uh, Laracobius is a, an obligate predator of, of, uh, of delgids. And it, Osakensis is native to Japan. It just, it's actually, we just started releasing it on the East Coast. It's thought to be more aggressive than Laracobius nigrinus that I'm going to talk about next from the Pacific Northwest. Um, so we have yet to see how this is going to play out, but um, we're anxious to get uh, all these different players out there so that we can uh, effect effective natural control, uh, biological control. So Laracobius nigrinus from the Pacific Northwest, when it is the most common predator out there. Um, it's easy to work with. You get the adults, the adult beetles out. You, you can handle them very readily and you can release them. It's really a, a great uh, biological control agent. Good synchrony with the hemlock lily delgid emerging in fall, feeding on the uh, developing systems generation throughout winter. And then right about now when the eggs are formed, they lay their eggs. And so the progeny, those young larvae that you can see in the upper right hand corner, they like to eat the eggs and the early instar nymphs of the adelgid. And then they drop down into the soil and pupate and spend the summer as a pupa, emerging then as an adult in the fall. Now it's been released in 16 states on the East Coast since 2003. And one of the questions we had about this insect is, What's what's the beef? You know, for many years we we released them and we just catch a few here and there. They really weren't doing anything until 
just a couple of years ago at my favorite meeting in Annapolis, Maryland, uh, one of my friends from North Carolina, he had this big grin on his face when he saw me and he said, guess what, I just collected 3,000 Laracobias. And uh, it's really remarkable uh, how the populations down there have grown. Um, and indeed, I was down there in 2013 and we uh, collected it 20 miles from the point of its first introductions. Um, and in pretty, not huge numbers, but in pretty good numbers. And then in that same year, that fall, uh, me and, and other researchers, we collected over 12,000 12, and then took them and released them uh, in our respective uh, states. Um, it's is happening now, playing out in the Delaware Water Gap in northern New Jersey. Populations are just beginning to grow and we'll have yet to see what happens. Um, in New York, I first started releasing in 2009 around the Finger Lakes and I found it established at three of the earliest release locations. But, you know, one of the hard things is actually one of the locations I found it right off the bat the first time, the F1 generation, and one of my sites it was, I went through four years of not finding it and I was about to give up going back there and then the last year I was there I found it and boom, it uh, had really, uh, it had really come up and I caught many very, very quickly. So they are reproducing in New York um, and one of the questions that we have is that New York's cold so do you want to really use the warmer adapted Puget Sound biotype or, or maybe go into cooler areas like uh, Idaho and so both populations we've been I've released and interestingly enough uh, in the, those are the, uh, the blue dots on there I released in 2009 the two Puget Sound localities uh, have been established at Cotman and indeed uh, they got through last winter not this last winter but the winter before and so they've, they've seen some extreme cold um, but only one of the Idaho populations is established as far as I know right now but these are just a few of the locations. The red dots are the most recent uh, uh, releases from North Carolina. And so we're still waiting for these things to start breeding. Um, let's see, what do we have here? And so well, how do you produce these things? Okay, um, laboratory production is really expensive, and I'm not really going to go into it. And estimate is not $4 a beetle any longer. We're talking more like $8 a beetle. Um, because you know, it takes a lot of time and, and effort to get them going. And you know, consider a minimal release is 500 beetles. This adds up really quickly. So my thought right now for New York State, uh, and indeed I'm funded to try and to work on this, this idea, is to actually establish field insectaries in New York. And in the lower right-hand corner, you can see a hedge there planted in front of a house. That's in North Carolina. I went back to that hedge every day for a week and I caught 200 predators within about a half hour of beating those hedges um, and just, just like clockwork. And so my idea is to find hedges like that around New York State and rather than releasing predators in the wild forests where they'll go up to the tops of trees and be absolutely un unreachable, if we release them on these hedges around the state, they'll be lo become locally adapted, I hope, and we'll be able to go back to these hedges and easily collect more predators uh, to distribute around the local area. Um, so this is the success of biocontrol in North Carolina right now, and it looks pretty poor, right? Well, it's because they started way too late. Uh, in 2003, a lot of these trees were pretty heavily uh, uh, impacted. You can see, though, there are still a few that uh, they are still alive. Um, and, you know, that's the hope, uh, that, that this will finally be able to save a few trees and they'll be able to reestablish. But I'm very conservative, and when it comes to uh, the, the genetics of the trees across the landscape, I just look at them and I say, God, that's the one thing we really need to pay attention to. We have to have the genes for the future. These seeds, they do not store very well in the cold, cold storage situations, uh, and so I think it's really impingent upon us to plan to conserve the genetic resources before they're gone. And the only way to do that is with kind of chemical control, uh, systemic insecticides. Um, identifying magnificent individuals is really important. You know, basically, I look at a big, beautiful tree, 
And I see the beauty of the tree, and you know, I was, was always searching for a reason. You know, why is it that just gets me? And now, from a from a forest health perspective, I look at that tree and I see, well, that's a big bag of genes that has withstood the test of time. Those are the genes that work in this location, and that's why it's important, I think, to really plan ahead in that respect. Conserving aesthetic resources is important. A lot of the parks around here are very concerned that the hemlocks are so important to them, and then also to maintain ecosystem functions. Um, so these are the systemic insecticides that uh, we've been using in the United States. Uh, there's basically imidacloprid and dinotepuran. Uh, as a directum, triazin, I'm probably familiar with that up there, it's been used for uh, emerald ash borer in Canada. It's not registered for hemlock woolly adelgid right now. Um, and in the United States, it is registered for hemlock woolly adelgid, but right now the, the studies that I've seen, uh, I'm really uncertain about its efficacy on um, hemlock woolly adelgid, whereas imidacloprid and dinotepuran have been used for a long time and it's well established uh, that they're very efficacious and amazing tools, uh, I've got to say. Uh, imidacloprid, uh, basically there's various formulations. It's been around for a long time. Uh, in application techniques, there's injections, time-release tablets, uh, soil drenches are available to homeowners, and basal bark spray. This is a new one that uh, we just got going in New York State. The big plus for imidacloprid is that it's effective for seven years or more when it's, with just one application. So here's an inexpensive insecticide, it's systemic, and you use one application, it lasts a really long time. Um, the problem with that is it's very slow to move into the tree. Uh, it takes up to a year. And so you can actually get a population that will go through two more life cycles, two more generations before you finally get the insecticide up in the tree. That's where the dinotepuran comes in. Safari, it's I, I used as a basal bark spray only. It's very fast moving into the tree. Within just a couple of weeks, it will get into the tree, but it's only good for one or two years. So what I'm finding now is that a mixture of both of these insecticides is a very efficacious way to get in and save trees. And I'll show you an example of that uh, shortly here. Um, so when we're thinking about the best management practices, the older trees showing decline, you really need to use the dinotepuran to get in there and save as much of the canopy as possible so that it allows the imidacloprid to get up into the tree because it takes such a long time. The Quartec time release formulation, these little tablets, that's what they're using right now in the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. They're trying to save 1% of the hemlocks in Great Smoky Mountain National Park. And they're doing that by enlisting volunteers to go out there and to, uh, with backpacks full of these Cortec tablets and putting them at the base of hemlock trees. And the you know, Great Smoky, the, the National Park System is not very uh, keen on the use of insecticides in the park, um, but they deem the, the saving of, of the hemlocks as, as worthy of the effort. Uh, but associated with that treatment plan, they did some studies on the movement of imidacloprid uh, in the soil, and it was amazing how little uh, the imidacloprid moved uh, over time, and the impact was just absolutely uh, min minuscule, uh, um, and they saved the trees as well. Uh, now, the basal bark spray is something that we just got with the, with the imidacloprid in New York State, and so we're actually doing a tank mix of imidacloprid and dinotepuran that can be applied, applied at the same time um, and uh, on, on the trunk, and I'll, I'll describe that in a little bit. Uh, the younger trees, without much canopy deterioration, can be treated with the imidacloprid uh, uh, very easily, and so young trees is a, is a, a very inexpensive way to treat them. Uh, so this is an application that I see actually as being very important, uh, perhaps as the hemlock woolly diligent expands in New York State, and perhaps as a strategy that could be used in Canada given the right, given the use of the chemical tools. Um, Zora Valley is a is an amazing place just south of Buffalo, and it's got an amazing old growth forest uh, down there where you see that right down in this area. Um, this old growth forest is, is it's huge, you know, 300, 400 acres. And um, so I decided to go down there and check it out. And I hadn't been there before I heard about it. These cliffs are 450 feet tall. It's just a beautiful place. And so sure enough, within the first half hour, I found one tree right next to the creek. The branches right next to the creek on that tree where I had a light infestation. And we spent the rest of the day on the 27th of September looking all over the place. Couldn't find a dang thing. 
Then we went back a couple of years, a couple of weeks later, with a, a, a dozen volunteers. We split into groups, and we get, at the end spent the whole day looking very carefully through uh, this area. And we, we determined that really there probably weren't very many other, weren't any infested other infested trees. So I got to thinking about this, and it's like what an opportunity. Here's the tree that's leaning over the, the creek with the branches. These are the branches that were infested. Um, so it just dawned on me that here we have this amazing resource and we perhaps have the first one or a couple of trees uh, that are infested. And I got I to gotta say at this point in time that I doubt that it's just this one tree because you find just a little bit in a stand and you know it's probably been there for a year or two and that's one of the most important aspects of using those uh, those goofy balls with uh, velcro on them is that you can get up into the crown and rapidly uh, look at trees and, and you know and detect very very low level populations and so you know I think that it's not just this one tree I think there's probably a lot of trees around there that have very low populations in them um, and so this is the timeline. It's, it's a miracle, actually. I got the state government to operate so rapidly. So I, I basically raised heck and said, listen, this is an opportunity we can't miss. We've got to get in there. Let's treat a buffer around the, that, uh, that tree. And uh, they agreed to do it. Uh, the state government found uh, five people to spray. And um, they went in, and they had those trees treated really quickly with the basal bark spray. And um, then they just said, well, we have some extra time. And I said, well, go across the creek. I wasn't able to get there before. And sure enough, they went across the creek. They found two more infested trees, and they treated all the trees around that. So 600 trees they treated uh, in that afternoon um, in those two locations. And uh, it took them only five hours to treat 600 trees um, with a buffer all around those few trees. Um, and so I'm waiting now to see what happens. And uh, so we're going to put out some monitoring to see if there are any more indulgents out there. Um, it will be very interesting. But I look at this and I say, if we were able to take down the population in that area, uh, we might have bought five or ten years, five or ten years that are just so critical in developing the biological controls, which I feel are an absolute necessity for the long-term uh, survival of hemlocks across the landscape. Um, so the treatment basically, basal bark spray with the tank mix of safari uh, and, and, and imidacloprid. Uh, the thing about it is, is that it was critical to use the safari because it very rapidly moves into the tree. And so we did that last fall. So what it's doing, it, hopefully it's taking down the population so they don't produce any eggs this spring. Uh, that's the really, really critical thing. And putting in the imidacloprid is just the insurance to be sure that you know, if any do persist, that they will die uh, uh, because the, the trees are treated. And this is the technique right here uh, where they have a backpack sprayer and they just spray the, uh, the insecticide on the base of the tree. It doesn't even touch the soil, basically. And the really amazing thing is that the cost of the product was about a dollar per diameter inch. And it was very rapid. It was really inexpensive. And I think that this is a, a good direction uh, to go in in New York State uh, when we find it, especially if it gets, when it gets into the Adirondacks with that huge, huge uh, resource uh, up there. So what is the integrated pest management? Uh, insecticide treatments, they're efficacious, very efficacious. They're inexpensive, relatively inexpensive. Uh, and I think they're a really important tool to slow the spread and keep select trees alive to maintain the diverse gene pool for future forests. Classic biological control, it's necessarily a long process. And the, result, the results in the landscape are just becoming apparent. Um, we need to step up efforts. I think we're about 10 years behind in New York. I wish we had started when we first got it in the 80s. Um, but, you know, it's like there's no time like the present. I think we really need to increase production of predators in the field and sectories so we have them across the state and we can use them as they, and we can spread them around as they are needed. And then we need to integrate systemic insecticide treatment with the biocontrol efforts in priority areas like state parks uh, to maintain the aesthetics as well as the long-term control uh, and to treat valuable trees uh, treat valuable trees and leaving the younger trees to harbor the immaculately indulgent to feed. So what am I doing? Um, right now, um, 
our approach in New York State has been disjointed. We have state parks, we have the Department of Environmental Conservation, we have uh, a number of agencies, the Nature Conservancy, there are a number of landowners across the state, and we're all very concerned about this now. I wish this concern had been at the same level now as of, uh, 10 years ago, but that's okay, I'll take what we can get. But right now I think it's important uh, to get the group working together, so I'm starting the Hemlock Initiative. Uh, basically to identify stakeholders. Uh, and I think we need to identify priority hemlock stands uh, and then be sure that they're monitored, be sure that there are people out there watching them so we know when the earliest stages of infestation occur so we can get in there, be sure to do a very accurate delimitation and hopefully stem the tide and so that we have time to develop the biocontrol. Um, engage the stakeholders to assess management efficacy. It's really important uh, to be sure we're doing it right. I can't stress enough the need to conserve uh, genetic resources and to develop um, the biological control. Really, we really need to get on that and uh, make a focus of our effort getting that biocontrol built up before it gets into the Adirondacks and it goes crazy. So I, this is not hemlock related, but I've tried to end my talks with another cartoon in the past and I've been booed down. So there it is, one of my favorite cartoons by Joe Heller from the uh, Green Bay Press, one of my favorite cartoons. He's a very gracious cartoonist. He allows me to use this. So um, I guess I'll, uh, we have a couple of minutes here so I can take some questions. Yes, thank you, Mark. That was a very interesting presentation in the control and management options for hemlock woolly adelgid. And we do have some time for questions, so if anybody has a question for Mark, you can enter it into the side panel of the GoToWebinar program now. Uh, the first question I have here for you, why do you think there is so much variability in the length of time for tree mortality to occur? Oh, okay. Well, you know, I still, I, I don't have any ideas. I think that, you know, it's probably related uh, to winter die-off in colder areas. I think that, you know, the, the amount of uh, uh, insects that are killed by the cold temperatures can't help but have an effect on the rate of population buildup. Um, but also, I think there's uh, soil aspects of it. You, know, you get a weakened tree, maybe you get it on a, a very shallow soil. Uh, a shallow rocky soil and you get a really dry year, that's going to really weaken the tree and inhibits its capacity to produce vibrant shoots that might help it to recover after being defoliated. Uh, there's just so many things going on with this insect. Uh, it's difficult to tell. Um, and you know how fast that, you know, they're correlated. That's how fast is it going to spread? And I, I don't really know. I've been dumbfounded at the rap rapid rate in which it's gone across uh, New York State, uh, especially considering that it was first really found around uh, Ithaca area, actually probably introduced by nursery stock in 2009 or 2008, and here it is just uh, uh, you know, seven years, eight years later, and we're looking at um, and we're looking at it spread all the way out towards Buffalo and, and really becoming quite ubiquitous within the area. So, you know, there's, anyway, that's a, a long way to get that answer for you. Okay, uh, the next question here. Do you know what areas of Ontario have confirmed presence for hemlock woolly adelgid so far? Yeah, um, I've, of course, I've, the only information I have is that provided by my, my friends and colleagues. And uh, there's one population developing in the Niagara River area in that canyon. And um, interestingly enough, I think that uh, originally they found out on one tree and took that tree down and, and uh, thought that maybe hopefully that they were done with it. Um, but, you know, my gut feeling is that there's no way. Uh, if you got it on one tree, you have it more, much more widespread uh, in an area. You probably have, you know, have it on a hundred trees around. And that's why uh, when I talked about our response to the Zoar Valley, um, we treated not just that one tree, but all around it, that buffer. And I still don't think it was a large enough buffer, but it was all that we could deal with at the time. Uh, the only other location I've heard of was in uh, 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 suburban uh, Toronto. 
and I don't know the name of the, uh, the neighborhood, but apparently that was a relatively isolated uh, uh, urban planting, and the tree was taken down and des uh, destroyed, and uh, there's been no detection since. I got to say, in the uh, uh, Niagara area, there's been basically you know one tree a year discovered since then, and um, I you know I just I think it's much more widespread and. Uh, I think accurate delimitation, hopefully with, uh, with uh, the Velcro balls, uh, will help to understand what's going on there. So do you think hemlock woolly adelgid could become a major pest in Ontario? And if so, when do you predict this could happen? I will not predict the timing, um, because you never know when that bird's going to fly in. Um, but I do, I do think it will be a major pest. I, you know, my work with cold tolerance shows that I, I don't really think cold is going to be uh, that big of an inhibitor of its movement. Um, it might take longer to get into colder areas, but you know, with the genetic link between cold tolerance and uh, um, uh, I, I think that the populations will gradually evolve to be colder, uh, more cold tolerant. And if you take an example of the, the balsam woolly adelgid and the fact that it's now found in the, some of the colder areas of the balsam fir, that uh, I, I don't have a lot of hope. And uh, one of the reasons I feel comfortable in this doomsday approach is that I realize that here in New York, we were, we were way behind the eight ball right now. We just we should have been working on this much more diligently years ago. And you know maybe, maybe if I had been more uh, 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 vehement in my, uh, uh, in my predictions uh, of, of doom and despair, we might have gotten more action. I don't really know, but I wouldn't do that. I'm too conservative when it comes to the possibility of losing whole species of trees across the landscape. So have tree removals or pruning been used as a control strategy? Uh, not in New York. I, I, well, we have a little bit, yes. There's one instance, I think, where we, uh, we had a couple of heavily infested trees in an area that they had just moved into. And so what we did, uh, we discovered them before the insecticides would have had time to get into the tree and take down uh, the egg-producing systems generation. So we removed the heaviest populations there, taking down those trees. But then we treated all around that a buffer area, probably about uh, a couple hundred meters from there. I forget how many trees we treated. So it's really important. You know, it's like when you have those populations on a couple of trees, you have to assume that it's much more widespread because you know those eggs. It's, it takes a while, a few years, for the populations to build up in those few trees, and then all that time you have those a those crawlers coming out there and then they're they're blowing off uh, in the wind and spreading through the stand and so you know you're you're by taking down the trees you're taking the ones that you see but they just i just i just do not assume that that those are the only trees around uh, that are infested okay so we're getting a little low on time here so i just have time for one last question um, how do you address concerns about possible non-target effects of the chemical and biological controls that you use for hemlock woolly adelgid? Okay, that's that's a good question. Um, first of all, the biological controls, uh, the we're you know we're not dummies anymore. I mean, yes, we screwed up in the past, um, but uh, that the the, the screw-ups actually um, I think forced uh, science. To take a quick, uh, to take a very strong look at what we're doing, and so the the science of biological control is really uh, uh, highly developed, and we're very very careful doing tests to be certain that the insects that we are bringing in to the United States or to North America are highly specific to only the insect, the target insects that we're looking at. We do double blind tests. We you know test them to be sure that you know they they can't. Uh, 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 I'd say grow and mature, and and be, uh, lay, uh, be that they mature, that they how would you say develop to maturity only on the host species that we're targeting, uh, and not on any of the others. Um, the uh, the insecticide effects. I mean, these are systemic insecticides. They get into the tree. It's not like the good old days of spraying uh, for spruce budworm over hundreds and thousands of acres. And indeed. The, uh, the insecticide it gets into the tissue, so only insects that feed on the tree itself will be impacted. 
And you know, to think about uh, non-target effects like on pollinators and such, you know, hemlock is a wind-pollinated tree. And indeed, uh, all the conversations that I've had with my colleagues here on campus who are bee specialists say that there's uh, no pollinated that ever has used uh, the pollen of, of uh, hemlock or, for that matter, the pollen of, um, of ash, it also a, a wind-pollinated tree. So non-target organism impacts are, uh, are limited only to those that feed on the trees. And you know, it's like I, I look at it now, and you know, I got into my specialty is biological control, and I got into the business back in the day uh, because I was pretty upset at the way chemicals were being used in a willy-nilly manner uh, across the landscape. And now I've sort of really come around uh, to realize that the use of chemicals is absolutely essential uh, to save a species of trees. And that's, that's huge. I mean, there are, there are always trade-offs, I think, in every management action that you take. But to save a species of tree across the landscape as important as the foundation species that we have in hemlock, I think it's really important to evaluate uh, you know, what's going on and what your end goal is. Okay, great, thank you. And for those people asking about the presentation, we will be posting a recording on the Forest Invasives website and on the Invasive Species Center YouTube channel. So I should have the posting or the recording posted by mid next week. Um, on behalf of everyone, I would like to thank Mark for joining us today and giving us some insight into the research behind the control of hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, I encourage everyone to register for our next webinar, which will be held on Thursday, April 30th at 1 p.m. Next week, we will hear about invasive forest pathogens. Lethal pathogens such as beech bark disease and butternut canker are slowly spreading throughout Canada's forests. Dr. Richard Wilson from the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry will discuss the impacts of these invasive species and the management options that are available. Thank you to everyone who logged on today to view our presentation. You can visit our website at www.forestinvasives.ca for more information and to register for the rest of the series. I hope to see you all back here next Thursday. Thank you and have a great afternoon. Thank you, everybody.